Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, webinar by the International Agonomics Association on Human-Robot Interaction. Uh, my name is Sasha Wisniewski. I'm uh, with the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and uh, we are um, today presenting this webinar as Technical Committee on Human Factors um, in Robotics. Uh, we are very happy about the uh, big interest in the community, and uh, I'm here today with uh, experts in the field of human-robot interaction. Um, I'm here today with uh, Professor Julie Shah uh, from the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Computer Science and Artificial Lab, um, in Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the U.S., um, I'm here with uh, Arash Ajudani, um, a principal investigator at the Italian Institute um, for Technology, and Patricia Rosen, Rosen she's a senior researcher um, and deputy head of unit of human factors and economics at the German Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Um, these three experts have, present, have prepared pitch presentations in their field of expertise, and um, during the next round about 90 minutes, um, they will give their presentations and uh, you have the chance to uh, ask questions. So after the round about 20 minutes presentation, um, we have 10 minutes for questions um, on the specific topic that is uh, presented to you. Uh, we will record or the webinar is recorded and will be put to the International Economics Association YouTube channel afterwards. Um, for further dissemination. And uh, I would say that's enough from my side. Um, I think we should start with the first presentation. I would like to give the floor to Julie Shah. I'm very happy that she's here today and she will give us a presentation on intelligent machine teammates. Uh, Julie, um, the floor is yours. Um, please go ahead. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Go ahead and share my presentation. My name is Julie Shaw. I'm a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, and I lead the interactive robotics group as a part of the computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory. So I'm an AI researcher and a roboticist, and um, my area of research is in developing computational models um, for AI, for intelligent robots, that are capable of modeling people to facilitate more effective collaboration between humans and machines. And the vision, the larger vision behind my lab's work is to be intentional about developing computing that augments um, human capability rather than replaces it. Um, and I've spent much of my year, my career working in robotics uh, for manufacturing, developing and deploying collaborative robots that work alongside people to help build planes and help build cars. And we have you know, uh, increasing numbers and examples of um, you know, systems being deployed um, that are changing the way that we organize work in, uh, in various industrial environments. Um, and so two examples are shown here. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think it's still useful to point out though that by and large, the way these technologies are being utilized in warehouses and in industrial environments um, is in ways that are uh, separate from from people. So, uh, in 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 warehouses, we see you know uh, shelves that are robots uh, moving around, but but still in spaces that are physically separated from where people are are doing their work. Um, and we have new collaborative robots that are safe enough to deploy without a cage right alongside people. Um, but they're still doing work that's uh, by and large independent of the work that that a person is doing. So these, these systems are, uh, you know, in, in these industrial settings, this is the systems that still coexist rather than uh, collaborate. Um, and, you know, the stats you know, change from year to year, but you know, there are um, more than 1.8 million industrial robots in operation around the world today, which is a lot. Um, what, I, what I like to do as a part of talks when it's a little more interactive is ask the question, you know, given that 1.8 million number of robots in use around the world, how many robots would you guess are in U.S. homes today? And in the U.S., I'm, I'm based in the U.S. And um, the answer, no matter what the audience is, whether it's roboticists, AI researchers, or a general audience, the answer to that question ranges somewhere from 10,000 in U.S. homes today to like 10, 10 million. Um, and the number uh, is actually uh, somewhere around 30 million uh, robots in U.S. homes today. 
And those are things that just that look like robot, robots, like Roombas. So it's not counting many other systems like um, service robots in, in hospitals, sidewalk delivery robots, uh, which we see in, in increasingly in many places uh, such as San Francisco. Um, it's not counting security guard robots. Um, in the US, uh, we have these strange uh, supermarket robots with these googly eyes um, that go up and down the aisles um, looking for spills, which are a significant uh, hazard. And I, I had the fun of uh, encountering uh, one you know, for, for the first time when they were first deployed. So um, you know, we have a lot of robots around us today in our everyday lives. Uh, but we don't feel as though we have, you know, this many robots. And a part of the reason is that they're limited in the value that they can provide to us currently. Um, much like in the um, industrial sector, these robots are doing narrowly uh, defined tasks um, in relatively structured environments and essentially under constant human oversight. Um, they're limited in the ways they can integrate into our everyday lives, just like they're limited in the ways they can integrate into our workflows in factories. And a part of that is that they don't see us as humans. They, you know, we are we are just obstacles to them, <laughs> like anything else. Um, and and that's okay, you know, when it's a Roomba and it bumps into your ankle occasionally. Um, but it's not okay um, when these systems are deployed at scale. And we're at this turning point where um, these systems are increasingly deployed and, and, to, and to realize their benefits, you know, you aim to deploy them at scale. Um, and, uh, you know, for a robot that doesn't see us as a person, this is potentially highly problematic. So this is a headline taken from the news a, a few years ago. Um, at that point in time, there were actually so many startups deploying sidewalk delivery robots um, that you know, people felt unsafe um, in San Francisco. So. Um, the elderly and, and people with disabilities went to the city um, and asked that they be removed. And that, that's exactly what happened. So these robots were removed from the most populated areas of the city. They were relegated to an industrial sector and there were limits placed on how many of them could be on any one city block at a time. Um, and so you know, this, um, this is meant to just underscore uh, the value and the point, uh, you know, as we aim to integrate these systems in these more complex organic environments, the need for them to uh, see us as, as, as people. So, um, you know, I've, I've worked in the manufacturing domain uh, for many years and, uh, and in teamwork is, is crucially important here. And so a, a challenge problem requiring a lot of interdependence would be, well, you know, what would be required to embed a robot um, teammate or collaborator into what is a fairly complex, um, you know, uh, workflow, in this case, three people building up, um, you know, the body of a car. And uh, how does that robot uh, bring its capabilities, uh, be able to sort of pitch in as a team member and also be able to adapt because people don't work like robots and shouldn't have to be made into robots in order to work with robots. So um, my, my research focuses on developing um, artificial intelligence uh, that enables robots to integrate more seamlessly um, into three sequential steps. Uh, first is in planning for the work um, that you'll do. So, um, you know, think about, uh, you know, pe people plan in teams, uh, think about emergency response teams sitting around the table planning their, their deployment, uh, supporting that, that human process. Um, but of course, no matter how much time you spend planning in advance, um, we never can fully anticipate, you know, how work needs to be done um, or what we'll encounter um, in the real environment. Uh, and people need to train with technology. They need to train with robots the way they train with other forms of technology. So enabling these systems to take um, plans and refine them through observation, through human demonstration, and uh, through training and co-training um, is, a, is a crucial part of um, my lab's research. Um, that's the refined step. And then finally, we want these machines and robots to be able to take those refined plans and use them online to be able to um, you know, not just know what has to be done, but be able to track um, you know, a person's, a collaborator's progress through the task and, and um, make fast changes um, when things don't go according to plan. And so um, my lab works on, you know, taking sort of the foundations of what makes a human an effective human team partner, our ability to know what another is thinking, our ability to um, anticipate what they're going to do, uh, and then be able to make fast changes when things don't go according to plan and give those capabilities to, um, to robots 
uh, but also machines, uh, other, other intelligent machines that can support us in, in many aspects of our lives, you know, through anticipating and providing uh, informational resources, not just say physical resources. Um, and so a number of years ago, um, my lab looked at a challenge setting uh, in which we were uh, thinking about the challenges of deploying service robots in a hospital setting. And, um, and we looked at a labor and delivery floor and uh, it turns out there's this particular nurse, the resource nurse or the nurse manager that runs the hospital unit, the labor and delivery floor. And she's essentially doing the job of an air traffic controller. So she takes in all of the information that you see on those LCD screens, the current state of the labor floor on the right, which is actually uh, book kept with a handwritten whiteboard. And she makes many decisions, decisions on which nurses are assigned to which patients, which patients are assigned to which rooms. She controls many aspects of the OR schedule um, and other decisions. And um, she's essentially an air traffic controller. Uh, from a computational perspective, she's actually doing the job of an air traffic controller, um, but without any decision support. And so um, this is a job that, you know, there's no codified training process or rule book for how you do this job. Much like air traffic controllers, they sort of, um, some people can do it uh, and other people can't. <laughs> um, and um, those that are, are capable uh, and that sort of grow into this role, uh, train others through an apprenticeship process. Um, they're doing you know, a highly skilled, very challenging, cognitively challenging task. And much like air traffic controllers say they were kind of born to do that job, that's uh, nurse managers say they were really born to do the job that they're doing. They're like superhuman performers. Um, now, um, there's a strong motivation for being able to um, uh, codify uh, you know, their, their decision-making process because that can be used in training up novice nurses. Um, and there's also a desire to be able to um, learn and understand the evolution of the workflow on a hospital unit to be able to integrate um, many, many other uh, technologies like service robots. So there's um, decades of study in the human robot interaction literature about the, the introduction of service robots um, in these contexts uh, and why that they're not um, often adopted. And I kind of joke, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out because this nurse's job is to supervise and task um, a set of highly autonomous entities, like other highly skilled nurses, um, as well as managing many other resources. And then you give them this task of at a very low level needing to, in a very dynamic environment, task and schedule a fleet of these um, robots that you know, perform service tasks, uh, delivery, or turning over rooms. And it's um, from a cognitive perspective, it's, uh, their, their job is already challenging. Um, we, we, I, I, one of my outstanding PhD students spent a year embedding with um, these nurses learning about their job and was able to develop a novel machine learning model uh, that could sort of learn from de demonstration, uh, the heuristics or strategies that uh, nurses use in solving these um, types of resource allocation and scheduling problems. And I'll show you a demonstration of that and then, and then talk about how this inspired the next line of research in our lab. So this little robot, it's not a service robot, it's a demonstration robot, but it's uh, using its camera to read the handwritten LCD or the handwritten whiteboard in the hospital. Um, and then making uh, recommendations or suggestions of, of the next decision for the nurse. What is a good decision? Right, like, and it kind of made me like, I recommend And so you can see that's the full set of information that a nurse uh, uses in, in making these decisions. What is a good decision? <laughs> I recommend placing a new patient in triage bed on a A bad decision would be to place a scheduled cesarean section patient in room 14 and have nurse Kristen take care of her. Ginger, what's a good decision? I recommend placing a scheduled infection patient in room 14 and have nurse Kristen take care of her. I don't know if you plan to go back to work, but for me, it was like this the one thing. Ginger, what's a bad decision? I agree. So these were demonstrations of the capability, but um, we developed a high fidelity simulation environment and, and conducted uh, rigorous controlled um, human participant uh, experiments involving the nurses and the doctors. 
uh, looking at both robotic-based decision support as well as computer-based decision support. Overall, the, the nurses and physicians accepted the system's recommendation 90% of the time, which is an indication that the system learned a high-quality model. Um, the, there's no ground truth, so this is what we have. Um, so, um, you know, this is this is a success in some in some regard. Um, the goal here is not to replace, uh, you know, the nurse, um, uh, but to uh, think about ways in which suggestions of these systems for allocation of service robots or um, uh, or, you know, uh, in, in other settings can um, reduce the cognitive load on these nurses. Uh, to help reduce the cognitive load on the simpler decisions, to free up their cognitive capacity for the more challenging decisions uh, that they make that are very hard to, uh, to emulate with, um, you know, with this type of capability. Um, and so, um, so now what, I, what I'd like to do is, you know, while this looks like a success is, is talk about, you know, what's involved in making um, this type of system successful. And that's taking a machine learning expert, a superstar, and embedding them in the work environment um, you know, for the better part of a year, understanding the various features um, and contexts under which these nurses are making their decisions. And even you know, with that uh, very intensive process, it is impossible to encode or identify all of the features or factors that are impacting or inputs to, um, to the nurse's decision making. Um, and um, so, you know, uh, the, in, in, in different environments, there will be different factors that matter as well, highly personalized factors. So the ability to uh, learn the factors in a particular context or setting and the priorities and preferences over workflow is really incredibly important to the successful integration of these technologies. And this motivated um, you know, a, fo a follow on line of research in the lab to think about what are the ways we can sort of break free of the machine learning expert and to be able to uh, capture um, these implicit factors um, that affect a human's behavior, uh, workload, fatigue level, personal priority, personal preference, um, you know, all, of, all of these factors that, that are very difficult for a person to make explicit um, you know, in this, in this uh, model building process. And so we developed a structured model that supports efficient inference, uh, where you take some information about what you know uh, are the decision factors um, that matter in this context, uh, and then aim to learn the latent uh, or um, you know, not directly observed decision factors, um, as well as their dynamics. Uh, so employing non-parametric models. And um, we structured this model in a way that uh, that is advantageous for performing efficient inference. Um, so if you think about, we're trying to infer some the human's mental state or cognitive state. Uh, one of the structured assumptions in this model is that the human's cognitive state does not directly change uh, the world. So I can't like think my coffee cup from one side of the table to another, but something about my cognitive state or my mental state will influence my actions, which will result in me moving my cup or not moving my cup at a certain time to a certain place. Um, now, the challenge with, uh, you know, even when you structure these models to support efficient inference is that it's, uh, it's really impossible for a machine to learn uh, a model that corresponds to a human held mental model without additional input from a person. There's many, many possible explanations of my cognitive state you can think of that would kind of explain the behavior you see of me, but really only one of them aligns to, um, you know, a human held mental model. Um, and to make this uh, example, um, you know, if you think about a subway system, you know, uh, in New York, the subway goes uptown and downtown. Um, so it's a two state switching model. Uh, but in Boston, the subway goes inbound and outbound from some arbitrary point Park Street. So my human held mental model of the subway is different, whether I live in New York or whether I live in Boston. Uh, but just by observing the behavior of the subway, going to the end of the line, turning around and coming back, you would never be able to discern you know, what my human mental model is. So we, um, we've worked on developing techniques to take very high level information, like partial information about the rules in an environment or the change points of behavior from a person um, rather than labels and use that to guide or shape the inference process of a machine. So I might not be able to name uptown, downtown, inbound or outbound, but I as a person can tell um, a machine, my mental model of the behavior of the subway changes at Park Street or it changes at the end of the line. And then that's enough um, uh, to sort of take that input and use it to constrain the inference process to learn a human aligned model. 
And we've had success with this approach, both in human robot collaborative tasks, you know, in the simple subway domain I described, a car. Yeah. The machine can learn a model that's aligned with a ground truth model or a human mental model equally well to a fully supervised approach where a person has to painstakingly label every single input given to the machine. And unsurprisingly, when you don't provide any additional input and you just observe the behavior of the person, you don't learn um, a human aligned mental model. Um, and so what we do is we, we take these methods for quickly refining the model of a, of a human partner that the robot will work with. We combine it with a model of the task they're gonna perform and we use them together within a computational model that allows the robot to make decisions online to predict what the person will do and then decide what it will do in order to collaborate. Um, these collaboration tasks can be things like handover tasks, um, the robot providing the person the right part or the right material at the right time. Um, and, uh, and, you know, or uh, settings in which the person and the robot kind of share space. Um, and we're able to show that by learning these personalized models through, in, for, through very little but important interaction with a person, the system is able to learn a higher quality model and collaborate more effectively than if you even used a fully supervised approach or if you tried to handcraft your model of your human partner and your interaction. And so I'll finish up by showing a video of um, a robot using these learned human models uh, that explicitly model human mental state or latent state and maintain a belief over how certain or uncertain the robot is of what the person will do uh, and use that belief in order to collaborate effectively. Um, in this setting, the person will make sandwiches at, at four stations. The person has developed some preference, some order they'd like to move among the stations to make the sandwiches. The robot has learned those preferences. Um, and is now planning how to deconflict and stay out of the space of the person to be able to pour juice into the cups. You'll see that the robot is communicating with the person. So if the robot is highly uncertain of what the person will do, it'll explicitly command the person. Um, but we know from studies in, in team coordination that uh, teams where one is explicitly commanding the other are really you know, not effective teams. So if the robot is only somewhat uncertain of what the person will do, it will provide status updates about what it will do. So the person can- Hey teammate, uh, let's make some meals. I will pour juice. Please make and wrap the sandwiches. Let's start. And the robot is tracking the person's hand there and it's motion, fine grain motion to predict where they'll reach next based on the model. Please it's make the, the next person. sandwich yet too. To get started, the robot was very uncertain of what the person would do, so it explicitly commanded the person. That can reduce the robot's uncertainty to choose the correct station to work at. Um, in this setting, the robot is deciding where to move in a fine green manner at the motion level uh, and whether or not to communicate um, every 0.3 seconds. So you can see it moving through the space. The fact that it's um, you know, not communicating, um, you know, in this case, the robot was fairly con was highly confident that the person was going to reach to location one. And so the robot didn't provide any communication to the person and instead was able to plan to move to location two to pour the juice. Um, and that's because of the, uh, the, the model the robot had learned in advance um, of the latent states and dynamics. I am pouring juice at three. In that case, uh, the robot was somewhat uncertain of what the person will do, so it provided a status update to allow the person to efficiently mesh its actions with the robot. I am pouring juice at four. I am pouring juice at four. And in this video, you can see the robot was somewhat uncertain, so it provided an update. But after 0.3 seconds, the person hadn't moved much. The robot didn't have much further information about what the person was going to do. And so the robot in that case actually repeated its communication. So it gives you a sense of how, off, how I uh, finished pouring juice. often here the robot does maintain a highly confident model of the human's behavior by, by how little it actually is communicating. Um, and, um, and we see uh, significant benefits for that, that communication. The person and robot are able to perform the task faster, um, but actually with more communications than with a handcrafted model. So these communications are being utilized um, efficiently for the benefit of the team. 
Um, and so this is an example of how we can learn models of people and deploy them online so that robots can be more than just sort of, you know, uh, explicitly commanded what to do, but can be more collaborators that can jump in and kind of play the game with people. Uh, and with that, I can wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you um, very much um, for that very interesting uh, presentation, Julie. Um, I'll, I'll take a look in, in, in the chat or maybe just again the hint. If you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A section or in the chat um, chat section. Um, we, we, we have one, one question there. Maybe we can, we can start with that. Um, although the question is more moving into the construction work, um, but it's, it's, it's a question that is always in the field of human robot interaction. Um, do we see in the near future more collaboration or is it basically replacing humans? So also for the tasks that you have shown, uh, Julie, or I would, I would also add to that question and maybe say, um, who decides what the robot does? Is it if he can do it, he has to do it um, because he can do it 24-7? Or do I decide? So basically, yeah. Uh, how, how do you decide, decide in your task planning? Who's doing who's doing the task allocation and who's in charge of what which task? Yeah. No. These these are these are great great questions. So um, uh, I had a really excellent opportunity as a, as a member of MIT's task force on the work of the future to work with social scientists and conduct you know site site visits and, and surveys um, of a number of manufacturers. Again, on industry side, I'm not an expert. Um, in construction. Um, but what I can tell you from not just my own research, but that wider body of research is that you know, the same technology can be, uh, can be implemented in very different ways. Um, and for the organizational policies and practices have a, a lot to do with the success of a particular um, implementation of, of technology. And in, in some cases, it can be used to uh, not just um, you know, supplant human work, but actually reduce, you know, lower the quality of human work. You think about a person becoming a robot to work with the robot, which is um, you know, uh, you know, undesirable. And there are other very good examples in which the same technology is implemented um, in a different way that can achieve the best of all possible. You, know, you increase productivity. Um, and you increase uh, various, uh, you know, qual qualities that, uh, that are that are important associated with job quality. Um, and so, um, in 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 my own research here, one of the key goals is to is to develop intelligence that can give the human flexibility to still bring what humans very uh, very capably provide that is very different than what machines provide, which is our our very quick ability to to develop insight of what's required in a task. The ability to uh, enable a person to uh, learn, you know, follow a learning curve and figure out a different way to use that robot in a particular task and to give that capability to um, uh, to a shop floor worker rather than an automation engineer um, uh, can be very can be very uh, valuable um, sort of human uh, worker centered approaches, um, you know, were, were identified as as particularly valuable approaches to achieving sort of uh, the best, uh, the, the best part of that, you know, space rather than the, uh, the worst part of that space. Um, uh, so, um, you know, it's not just a matter of developing the right technology, but this much more holistic approach and, and solution to figuring out how to uh, achieve, you know, the the aims that everybody everybody hopes can be achievable. Okay. Um, yeah, I have one. Thank, thank you very much. Um, another question: What you showed in the beginning with the nurses, you had uh, now as an embodiment, basically for your AI. Um, so, would you say um, how important is that embodiment? This anthropomorphism for the technology acceptance, because on the other hand, you could have taken just a tablet or a smartphone or a smartwatch telling them choose option one or choose option two. And um, of course, now has now um, yeah, some, some kind of childish design, but still we can use anthropomorphic robots to, to help with these decisions. Do you think that's important? Um, or would you say, well, a tablet would probably also do the job or we have an advantage by using uh, yeah, some embodiment for this kind of uh, decision support systems? Yeah, no, this is a, this is a really great question. We uh, we had a lot of like the the nurses not just like the robot. <laughs> we were invited to deploy the robot, um, but we um, you know we had concerns based on prior literature about um, uh, calibration of trust in in a system providing um, decision support. And there's prior studies that indicate the more anthropomorphic the system is, the more it may engender inappropriate trust, compliance, and reliance on the technology. 
So uh, in addition to the sort of algorithmic advances, uh, we conducted um, a separate um, a human participant study uh, with the nurses and doctors looking at both uh, computer-based decision support and robotic decision support. Um, and uh, what what we found actually, you know, uh, we're very we're very interested. In, we're like re from a responsibly from a responsible deployment perspective, very interested in the ability of nurses and doctors to follow uh, transitions in the quality of advice being offered by the system. So um, you know, the system won't work well in every context. Can a nurse and doctor identify when you know after a few sequences it's provided high quality advice, and then it drops to medium quality advice or low quality advice? And interestingly, we found that nurses and doctors were better able to follow those transitions from high to low, high medium, low to medium, low to high, um, when interacting with the embodied system versus the computer-based decision support. And that um, that's an interesting finding. It's counter to some of the prior literature, and we do we do have um, you know a few few papers on it, but it, I think it requires more investigation and understanding. Um, uh, and these types of studies are, are, are critically important to understanding how you embed this technology in a real work environment in a responsible manner. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one last question. Um, it's about, yeah, did, does the robot sense or assess the human's cognitive workload? Or basically, how do you, yeah, does he, how does he feel? Well, he's, he's uncertain on what the human is doing. Is he also measuring some kind of cognitive workload or any anything? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so in these in these studies, often with our human participant experiments, we will do like a secondary task setup for for um, workload. The computational model we developed here, um, one of its values or benefits is that um, it can identify the factors that um, that appear to change uh, hu human behavior. So if you think about you, you you've been like you know you develop a task so it's low workload or high workload, and then you aim to validate that but where is that transition point in which uh the human behavior like changes in relation to performance of the task um and oftentimes those thresholds are set somewhat manually um, these techniques provide basically the, the ability to try to identify those buckets or bins or thresholds via data-driven approaches um, the complexity is that um, it's not only one factor, it's not only workload that's that's impacting what you see in a human's behavior. And so these techniques are, are bundling uh, presumably what are many complex interrelated factors into a small discrete set. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there's pros and cons to the techniques, but one of their values could be, you know, um, if you have a factor that's mediating behavior to be able to use them to finally identify uh, the different regimes that that you care about, um, uh, and then and then how to address them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Judy, and also for um, the discussion in the end. And um, I think that's a perfect um, yeah handover to uh, the next presentation from uh, Arash Ajudani, um, senior researcher and principal investigator at the Italian Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, he's talking about how to make collaborative robots aware of human actions and their ergonomics. So basically, we stick to the same topic and uh, we see um, the approach from Arash and his team. I'm happy that he's here. Arash, the stage, stage is yours. Hello. Um, thank you very much, Sasha. Um, thanks for inviting. And it's a big pleasure to be here. Uh, very nice presentation, Julie, as always. Uh, and. Um, so um, yeah, the, the introduction was, was done by Sasha, thank you. Uh, my name is Arash Ozudanya, I'm a principal investigator at IIT Italy. And I'll be talking about a little bit about, uh, let's say, um, how we can um, integrate collaborative robots. What Julie was mentioning is mostly on maybe social perspective, but I would like to tell you a little bit more on the physical perspective, although I believe that these two aspects should be integrated at some point. Um, this is the let's say a little bit old, um, this, this picture, but we are relatively um, uh, international. And as you can see, mostly students, a young group of people working on different, let's say topics that you'll be, you'll be seeing in the next slides. Um, we are working on a number of European projects, uh, in particular, uh, the SOFIA project, which is a, um, let's say a consortium project of 7 million euros that I have the um, pleasure of working with Sasha and Patricia in this um, project. And, uh, several different projects that focus on the collaborative robots and also ergonomics in particular, um, that I will be talking to. But there are others, also some other joint labs that uh, we are taking some of these technologies to higher 
technology readiness enables to be able to see them in industry functioning. So the um, the uh, let's say the, the the main research axes in my lab are uh, are, are these three. Um, we are working on human modeling in general and computational dynamics. We want to make sure that humans and robots um, can work, collaborate, coexist, and you know try to to uh, control this shared effort and make sure that the allocation is in between different agents of different capacities is done, let's say, um, efficiently. Um, we also um, have some, some uh, let's say, expertise in, in making robots autonomously work in the environment or either also teleoperated using a, a, an operator in a shared autonomy manner. Today, I think, uh, is the main focus of the, of course, the, the, the conference will be on the human ergonomics that I will tell you a little bit about our approach in tackling the, the challenges. So most of you working on this topic know that in industry, what we have is, uh, in general, in ergonomics monitoring of, of people, uh, especially in, in terms of industry, um, uh, we have a very simplified models. Let's say you, you might have heard about RELA, RUB, RULA, REBA, or EAWS scores and, and, and similar topics. They are quite nice, easily implementable, and mostly the inter industry is, is exploiting them. However, of course, they don't consider the interaction aspects. They are not extendable, and they are kind of, we call them pen and paper based, but they are very under, uh, let's say, specific. But on the right side, we have uh, very fancy uh, simulation tools that basically they are very computa computationally costly and uh, hardly real-time implementable. So the method that we are following in one of the projects, especially in the ERC project of mine, is that we are trying to bring some of the really nice tools that we learned from humanoid theory and apply them in understanding and calibrating and personalizing human. They are online, they are modular, scalable, and also, as I mentioned to you, they are identifiable. So um, we, we, we start from, of course, the theory of um, humanoids, but of course it's extendable to humans in modeling the human behavior in terms of center of mass, center of pressure, joint torques, et cetera. There are several works on this that I will go to the details knowing that we have uh, different expertise uh, in the call. Um, if you're interested, please go ahead and, and, and look at these papers. So um, one of the indexes, for instance, we developed was to try to, uh, trying to understand in real time what would be the effect of an external load on, uh, let's say, um, loading on the, let's say, what would be the loading effect of an external load on the joints? For instance, you can see in real time, we can estimate if a person is holding a, an object in different configurations, how much loading will be caused on elbow, shoulder, hip, knee, and ankle, and this can be uh, tracked in real time. So um, this model is, is, is was, was first built in, in offline, and then we started looking into ways of uh, re-identifying all these parameters for people. So we created an, a, a framework that basically you can see the, 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 the shadow, let's say, is suggesting postures to the person, the future worker maybe, to follow them. These are the minimum number of postures required to identify the model parameters that give you the center of mass center pressure information, which is required to model human dynamics. When the model is identified, uh, this is one time only for for subject. Then you built uh, this this type of let's say loading. Uh, we call it overloading index. And if the person uh, is is carrying heavy loads, what you can see is you can, you can actually give some level of risks to to different joints. Here you can see uh, different bad postures of eight kilogram. I think you will have uh, some high level of risk associated to the to the shoulder, although. Uh, in some other joints, you can see that the risks are low. Of course, this is posture dependent, monitoring every single posture uh, for, for that. Uh, the second important problem we were looking into, relying on the equilibrium torque hypothesis and, and formulation, trying to understand where is actually the contact point, right? Because not always uh, you're, you're dealing with the external world with your hands. In this specific example, it is the case. But what we are trying to deliver here is, is a framework that detects also where the point of contact is way before analyzing the, the torque. So here, the, after a few seconds of moving, the, the algorithm uh, automatically detects that the contact was at hand. And this can be also, let's say, somewhere else. You would see it here that uh, if, uh, if the contact will be, uh, happens to, to, to occur at the, at the, let's say, elbow level, uh, the algorithm can actually detect it and measure the torques and overloading torques uh, at the joints, which is quite nice. Uh, the eventual goal, as you all know, is to have these systems um, autonomously functioning without the use of people to tune and, and uh, code them. Uh, 
So um, these models are um, are developed. So what's next? I think uh, so far you understood uh, that one of the potential um, applications of these models is the real-time feedback in terms of visual feedback. You can provide them with screens, augmented reality, glasses, and stuff like that to the to the workers, and you can tell them, okay, if you continue doing this work in such a way, you will you will have issues with this joint and that. Um, but not always we can provide screen. Of course, um, actually, if you're working in in uh, let's say in smaller areas, imagine you're working inside a, an airplane, let's say um, structure, you cannot put screens everywhere. So we also developed some vibral tactile wireless interfaces that we put them on, on certain joints and we ran some experiments to show that yes, in bad postures, uh, according to the level of vibration and directionality that we are proposing, people were able to adjust and their postures while performing tasks to minimize the joint torques. And of course, this was supported by muscular activity at those joints uh, that was suggesting that the, the system uh, and the, the overall interface is functioning and reduces the, the effort. The second huge application of these models is basically to create some, some robot optimization control frameworks that they can change their behaviors in a way that the, 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 the collaborative persons, people working with the robot perform their jobs in the most, let's say, healthy ergonomic way, because most of you know ergonomics is economics, right? So if you do your job in a in a healthy way, you can you can be more productive, happier, and and the quality of life will increase. So can we do that? Can we use robots to to, to anticipate people uh, so kinodynamic states and help them? So the earliest work we've shown as an integration effort was in, in back in the early 2018, where we won the Cooper Innovation Challenge. Uh, this system was already uh, very um, complete. So we used the perception system through open pose, um, customized open pose. We detected human posture. And uh, we were also using some machine learning algorithms to detect the object and also update the dynamic model of the person to know how much load the person is carrying. And the robot, you could see that it's based on the model that I mentioned to you a couple of slides back, is always providing the best working condition uh, in terms of ergonomics, but also if the person is moving around, uh, the robot is uh, adjusting the trajectory to follow the person. The, the, the intelligence is not only limited to to basically the, the collaboration itself, but also to the actions of the robots. If you uh, pick uh, another tool the robot will detect and uh, the load object with that. I was uh, so far I was talking about the instant loading, but as you know, there are several repetitive lightweight tasks that uh, that basically uh, eventually can cause risks on, on on body joints, but not instantly. We are also trying to monitor that through the overloading fatigue uh, index that uh, you could see here um, after a certain period of time in that posture, you, if you develop some certain level of risk in certain joints, the robot can reconfigure and bring the task to a certain configuration that the level of risk at that point is minimized. Uh, these are um, whole body, let's say, integrated models that not only work on the shoulder, to give you an example, it can work on the at the ankle and hip level as well, but the robot always provide you a better working condition. Well, the system was, uh, the, the overall idea had the potential to be integrated in our mobile platform, we call it MOCA, which stands for Mobile Collaborative Robot Assistant. Uh, we showed it in multiple application domains, like multi-person uh, tasks, like here you can see a handover task, and eventually this robot, after doing the handover, arrives, detects the second person and tries to perform the manipulation task with the robot, always providing uh, a multi-objective, let's say, optimization framework, um, providing multi-objective optimization, let's say, um, facilitates that for the person to, to actually set up all the uh, objectives right. Um, the coexistence was, was also mentioned. We integrated that in our control approaches. Obviously, in, uh, in industrial settings, uh, Static obstacles and dynamic obstacles. And by dynamic obstacles, I mean maybe also the uh, coexisting partners that the robots should be able to avoid them to basically um, to continue to perform what they were uh, originally uh, asked for to uh, to arrive to a right person to collaborate with. So, as I mentioned in Sofia, in collaboration with Sasha and some other partners, we are um, trying to bring these these ideas and and, and uh, tools into industry. This is the one of the simulation tools we are using, provided by IMK. If you're interested, have a look. Um, the mix here. So this basically provides the tool to model the the status of the 
of the person, walk past th cycles, and also you can uh, simulate robots. This is the real um, use case that we, is being developed uh, at, uh, now. We are halfway through the project, still two years. Uh, uh, we we want to bring these, these two to the, the tool to action. But what I would like to show you is uh, we have um, some indexes by um, through, through simulations and, of course, backed by some experiments. We are able to analyze. Uh, how the entire um, uh, performance and economics of people involved in the task are changed um, after introduce, introducing these, these technologies. You, I'm not going to go through the details, but you can see that walk path per cycle is reduced, uh, the, the loading is reduced drastically, and also uh, um, if the person has more time to, to operate uh, uh, more machines in a lighter, uh, lighter way. I don't know how I'm doing the time. I think. Time. So, um, in parallel, we are working on um, a, a similar concept to collaborative robots, which is a little bit different in, a, in the sense that they are called supernumerary limbs. They can be considered, uh, although until today, I don't really distinguish, uh, them. I mean, this, these terminologies, uh, but let's call them supernumerary limbs because anyways, these are collaborative interfaces. So this is a passive interface that we, we developed recently. You can see that there are um, there's just a passive exoskeleton with uh, passive dampers that uh, we use it for load uh, compensation, and most of all for vibration isolation. Uh, we ran some experiments to, to see if uh, some of you know this uh, hand transmitted vibrations are extremely dangerous, especially in terms of blood pressure, uh, breath, blood circulation and other aspects if they are done repeatedly during the day. Uh, and this, this method can easily, this interface can easily um, let's say, um, minimize the risks associated to that. Um, in terms of loading, we are taking it to the next level. So most of you know about whole body exoskeletons. They are super cool, really, um, uh, let's say, performing in a sense that uh, they can be used uh, to, to very heavy, uh, heavy loads. You've seen the Iron Man movie, and it looks quite promising eventually. But one of the issues so far is basically um, uh, the, the cognitive load that you can see here, and also the, the inertia that you're supposed to move uh, when you're inside the box is quite quite scary and quite, let's say, um, uh, bothersome, let's call it. So we try to look at it from a very um, um, intuitive vision perspective. You can see here this, this, the system that we have through a really simple interface without any wearability constraint, without imposing any limitation on manipulation or locomotion of the person, you can use these interfaces to, to, to move heavy objects and uh, the person is quite light in terms of uh, cognitive and stress. Um, this is a very good alternative to such, uh, such um, variable systems. Obviously, if you're talking about the patient, those systems are not, are, are not replaceable. But uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, my, my, the focus of this talk is in the industry and uh, healthy people doing uh, industrial tasks. The, the potential of this system was quite interesting. And um, we thought of maybe uh, scaling, up, uh, scaling it up to different applications. For instance, you know, people with uh, some, let's say, minor or moderate uh, stability issues. So we thought of monitoring the center of pressure situation and stability of the person and use these systems with different strategies to, to help uh, people to regain balance. So in the first simple strategy, it was just basically stiffening up and becoming a, a, a walker. But the second strategy, when it was detecting a fall, the robot was providing some corrective action to the robot. So, um, SOFIA stands for socio-physical human-robot interaction. That is why we are also interested in looking into human cognitive ergonomics. But, but as you know, there are several ways of measuring them uh, in terms of uh, using biosignals. But uh, again, in industry, having EEGs or always connecting galvanic skin response sensors is not going to be very simple or practical. But what we are developing is, uh, is to use um, Again, robotics or robotics perception-based tools for detecting uh, the cognitive load. So this, these are very recent uh, works and publications uh, that I'm sharing with you. Um, some of them are actually under evaluation and review. Uh, by looking at people's, let's say, um, point of gaze, um, facial, let's say, features, or um, there are some body gestures that um, some 
I will be able to talk about it maybe in the next uh, presentation. But of course, if you can you can tell by looking at people how how they can be stressed. Um, we are monitoring this uh, also in terms of let's say where you're looking at if this is connected to the task or not, or if you're distracted or not. And uh, as a baseline, obviously we are we are we are um, controlling and we are let's see. Um, Granting this to one skin response and heart rate measures and stuff, but at the end, you only need a simple 100 euros camera to be able to track the person, um, body, and features. Very last slide. Um, we also provide more um, ergonomic interfaces in terms of um, teleoperation. We recently uh, developed a 3D mouse based interface that you can um, use this. To control each robot's movements and and impedance in terms of interaction, but also um, switch between different types of robots. So this is just one interface can be used to do uh, to move our Mocha arm in the mobile based system, but also can be switched to 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 the second uh, robotic arm that can we can do the robotic auscultation to hear the heart rate or respiratory, let's say um, features. Important in terms of COVID. Um, there's another feature to that is basically you can also make sure that with the same interface, the the two systems are functioning in uh, in coordination coordinated way. You can see this is a, the, the the another feature that comes for 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 free. Uh, free doesn't mean simple. It's backed by hundreds, but well, tens of thousands of code uh, code um, lines of code. But of course. Uh, is going to enable us to perform this. That's all. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge um, of my research. And if you'd be interested in, in these topics, especially from the human perspective, human modeling, I can just leave this slide for a couple of seconds. We're looking for a postdoctoral researcher and a junior researcher. If you're interested, just grab your phone and take a, take a picture of that. It takes you directly to the call. Uh, and once again, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you um, very much. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, Arash. Um, I, again, the remark, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I will start with the first question for Arash. And um, if you want to anticipate the user behavior and you just have a very limited amount of sensors available, what's the minimum amount of sensors you would say from your expertise, from your lab, that you need to put on the human? So is it three, five? just an external camera. So what's the minimum setup to do a basic collaborative right. task as you have shown? This is a very nice question, but if I can tell you from the experience we have had, I think human posture has a, a lot of rich information that you can capture it from. So um, if you can easily tell if, if a colleague of yours is stressed, sad, or or hyperactive only by looking at the person. You don't need to, to set up EEGs or stuff like that. Of course, um, we are talking about a certain level of accuracy, but, but I think posture information is the minimum and the cheapest way of measuring them. If you have means of measuring them through cameras, cameras are cheap, the algorithms are free and open source, you can, you can use them. Otherwise, you can just, <clears throat> if, if there are privacy issues involved, you can actually set up uh, a simple um, interface through IMUs, uh, inertial measurement units. You can, you can also, uh, capture the posture of the people. This is, of course, preliminary, and it, this can this can give you a very good uh, estimation. But um, but um, of course, um, as I mentioned, uh, I think posture information is the most rich and in, uh, rich in terms of um, anticipation of the of the actions and even cognitive state. And not only that, but also uh, I think you can get a lot of dynamic information out of the kinematic. Uh, let's say. Um, Parameters. I mean, uh, it might sound strange, but uh, you can tell uh, if if a person is, is holding a heavy object or not only by looking at the, the behavior after carrying a heavy tool. Or when you're throwing something, the acceleration or the whole body movement that that you have basically can tell you a little bit about the, the amount of effort you're putting in, or roughly. Uh, but of course, this these all should be backed by precise sensors, EEGs, EMGs, and all that. But to my understanding, this is it. But of course, there are other experts, Sasha, Julie. Um, Atisha, if you have other uh, opinions on that, I'll be really happy to hear. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, before I come with the next question, maybe I, I give it give it also. I give the floor to, to Julie or to Patricia. Um, maybe also to, yeah, to to Julie. Do you also um have any posture estimation algorithms in your applications? Because I saw in, in your video with the with the food, um, basically that was with just some kind of hand tracking in there. So is there also the body posture um involved, or is it about the uh yeah basically the movement and the position of the hand? Yeah, yeah. Um, I see it. Rush. Oh, what exciting work <laughs> and a great presentation. Um, I yeah, I, I I didn't present it, but we um, we we also have had some work over the years in um, in in human behavioral modeling and, and prediction of of motion, um, and the it was very very interesting for me to see this this was a number of years ago but um you know with almost just like 200 milliseconds of arm motion posture is so important for so many things but with with just like a little motion of the arm you could predict with maybe like 75 percent accuracy where a person would reach on a table uh, within four quadrants which is very helpful you know for a robot trying to collaborate or deconflict uh with the person um there's uh and then similarly uh there's, uh, if you track media lateral velocity and head turn, you can predict uh, a step or two in advance of whether someone will turn left or turn right. These very, as, as Arash made, it's a, a, a super great case. These very subtle uh, signals in uh, postural information can be very, very valuable. Um, yeah, I, I, might, I might just only add a caution on um, thinking about like classifying uh, emotional state of um, just uh, the the potential uses of um, of those technologies need to be sort of thought through very carefully and also the uh, the the labels or the cat the categories you know they're um, and sort of the reliability of those um, where the label data sets come from and you know what 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 was the intended use of the data set um, in terms of of why it was labeled and how it was labeled um, and making sure that that use is taken into consideration and in, in, in further use of any sort of uh, machine learning model derived uh, from that from that data. Um, but, uh, you know, Arash is the is the expert. I'm really just kind of echoing, um, you know, what he said of the importance of postural information. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, maybe also to, to Patricia, the question, because we have now from, from Ash, um, the, the measuring of cognitive workload. Um, maybe you can just give some, some information on your, your research in your experiments, um, how, how you proceed in, in, in this field with, with posture or with, with gaze or what, what's the approach there? Um, yes, of course. Um, so yes, I have to say, Arsh, I was also uh, very interested in the slides I saw and uh, in your setup measuring cognitive load um, from a um, not uh, on, on a um, questionnaire based um, approach. Um, and because I mean, we have had these um, experiences in our lab, and I think it's it's quite challenging. I mean, it is possible, and I think it's very the idea of online monitoring workload. I think this is very important. It's going to give us a lot of information um, on how people really experience the interaction. Because of course, if I do that after the interaction, I always have a time delay. Um, people will start thinking about their answers. Uh, so I always. Um, will always lose some information. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there are a lot of artifacts and um, the quality of measures could be, um, well, it really depends on the system. So therefore I'm very curious um, about the results you're going to obtain. And I really hope yeah, that you keep us um, updated on that because I think, yes, this is something, um, yeah, that could really um, close the gap um, to have real online and measurement of emotional um, workload and, and, and emotions as well. So, yeah. Of course, of course, of course. This is part of the collaboration work we have to do in Sofia as well. That's yeah. So. Very glad to do that. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll move to, to one more question, which is from the audience. And it's about, um, it's, it's for Arash. Do you also um, explore the integration of hand movement in the overall posture? So, um, because of course, tracking of the hand is is is, is difficult. So, is is um, yeah, are the hands parts of your tracking and orientation, or any details of the hand on gripping or anything? 
Right. So thanks for the question. Um, we haven't looked into ergonomics side of hand tracking, but we do hand tracking for human robot collaboration. Uh, we are users of the technologies. If you know, there are some libraries come with open pose that you can track also fingers. So we use one in one of our recent works that is just, again under review. We are uh, trying to understand where the where the person is put, putting the screws on the table by looking at the posture and also the fingers. When the person is putting the screw on the table, the robot can actually go there and perform the screwing. Of course, this is not going to be very precise, but you can know roughly where the screw is and then go rely on the um, local perception of the of the robot to adjust that that little bit. There are several really online and super nice tools that you can use for hand uh, hand tracking in terms of, of course, uh, using vision sensors. Uh, but uh, but also there are some uh, you know uh, IMU based sensory based uh, stuff, um, gloves and, and things like that. But uh, if your question was about ergonomics, no, we haven't looked at it, into this. But it's very interesting stuff. Uh, just one final remark when it comes to hands most of the issues uh, uh, if you if you read in the literature i mean you are the experts of course we are in the international ergonomics association um, are related to the vibrations so mostly the vibrations are uh, are the causing um, causing the, uh, let's say unhealthy working conditions okay okay thank you very much i think there's one question also concerning the title of a research paper i kindly ask the the audience just to to contact Arash directly on if you have a specific question on a specific research paper um via email and uh well looking at the time i would go and uh, move to the next presentation um which is once again thank you very much Arash, um for uh presenting and answering our questions. I would like to um, go to the next uh, presenter. She's uh, that's uh, Patricia Rosen. She's a senior researcher here at the uh, federal German Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, same time deputy head of the unit Human Factors and Ergonomics. And she will give us a presentation on human robot interaction, prevalence, and dimension for human centered design. I'm looking forward to the presentation. Um, Patricia, the stage is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sasha, for the introduction. And um, hello, everyone. Um, yes, so within the next 20 minutes or so, I would like um, to tell you something about the prevalence of um, robotics in Europe that can actually directly interact um, with humans. And I think that adds up maybe quite nicely to what Julie has um, just presented earlier. And then, of course, um, dimensions which should be um, considered from a human factors per perspective in order to create human-centered um, teams of uh, humans and robots. Um, so first of all, um, if we look at um, what the manufacturers, the, the large robot manufacturers which are out there um, bring into the market, um, we can see that um, within the last um, years, especially within the last um, 10 to 15 years since um, the technology of lightweight robots has evolved, they are bringing um, a number of variety of robotic applications onto the market. Um, they promise that new generation of sensors and actors actually will allow closer forms, interaction forms between human and robots. And if we look at a publication by the, um, which was published by the International Federation of Robotics, they even estimate that within 10 years time of today, they say that, for example, in a production area, um, all 50% uh, of the operators will be using um, a um, collaborative robot assistant. And um, so the question is, uh, will we reach that promise or, or the scenario um, in the future? And what does it look like currently? Um, so I brought to you the same video <laughs> Arash has already shown earlier <laughs> from the SOFIA um, project, um, but maybe from a slightly different um, perspective. And it also adds up to um, what Julie has presented earlier um, on the question, what are the scenarios of human robot interaction currently? So this is a, a video from, the, um, from a Dutch company. It's a small and medium sized um, enterprise and they are producing gears. Um, and um, they have, or within the Sophia project, we have um, decided to use um, this as a human robot interaction scenario. Um, and we can see that the um, that's a mobile platform um, where we have a universal robot um, on top of it, 
And this takes over um, the carrying and positioning of these cylindric parts into um, a debarring station. Um, and in the meantime, the human operator has the um, chance to perform a different task. Um, in a minute, um, he will come back into the workplace and will do some final adjustments in the debarring station. Um, and what we can see here quite clearly is, and this is exactly what Julie has said at the beginning, um, that we do have um, a close interaction and they do share a workspace, um, but we don't see a real collaborative task. So we only see um, the we only see the interaction form of coexistence, maybe of cooperation, but the real idea of collaborating on the same work on the same work piece at the same time, this is actually not happening currently. And um, we have to say that in many research projects, we don't really find use cases where it's really necessary that we have this real collaborative scenario. So this might be a little, um, yeah, a little mismatch of what some of the manufacturers, for example, of these systems um, promote, and then what we actually see out there. Um, so just let's take a look at numbers we can find there on the prevalence um, of robotic systems in Europe. And I brought to you here results um, from the ESNA survey. This is a um, survey which is conducted on a regular basis by the European Agency for Occupational Safety and Health, EO OSHA. And this is the data from the third wave, um, which was conducted in 2019. Um, and it's quite a large survey. Um, I think in this one, over 45,000 enterprises participated, and they get asked a lot of questions um, concerning OSH in general, but also on digitalization and which technologies they use at the workplace. And in this wave, they were also asked whether they are using um, robots that interact with workers directly. And what we can see here, um, so number one um, in Europe and some additional countries were also included like the UK. Um, Slovakia is number one, followed by uh, Denmark and the Czech Republic. But we can also see none of the countries do actually exceed the threshold of 10%. So we are still talking about pretty low numbers here. And if we take a closer look at um, in which sectors these uh, systems um, are available. And this probably is not very surprising, but we can see that manufacturing, of course, is quite large, um, closely followed by agriculture, forestry, and fishing. And again, this is not surprising, especially in agriculture. We see a lot of autonomous um, systems like these autonomous harvesting systems. So this is an area where um, we are um, yeah, quite far already. And also, which um, I think is quite interesting, if we consider the establishment size, again, um, we see that most of the um, robotic systems that closely interact with uh, humans are, um, they are, are present in establishments, um, larger establishments with 250 or more employees. So the smaller ones, um, yeah, we have, we see a little less. Um, so currently, we can say there are not that many uh, companies out there um, or many workplaces which actually have um, a, a real direct um, human robot interaction. But again, as Julie, I think, pointed out very nicely in her presentation, AI might be the, well, might be the tool to um, accelerate um, this development. Um, and I hear I found um, a, a review um, of some colleagues who just um, an analyzed um, in which areas of um, robotics AI is already part is partially or already fully integrated. Um, and we can see that a number of um, abilities um, is already supported by AI, like navigation and mapping or learning um, or planning. Um, and this, of course, will benefit human-robot interaction because it will um, cause robots to increase their core abilities. It will smooth the interaction with the human. And I think maybe the most important part is it will cause um, robots to be able to navigate and behave in very unstructured environments. So um, exactly as um, Julie has uh, already shown to us. 
So there's some, and I think if we take uh, into that into consideration, then um, probably in um, maybe not the next wave, but the wave after that um, it is now, we will see um, that the number of uh, robotic systems which can closely interact with humans uh, will rise in the future. This is, um, I, can, I think we can assume that. So um, what are the dimensions we should consider um, from a human, human factors perspective, especially in these advanced uh, robotics? Um, and here is a little framework um, we um, have uh, derived um, mostly from literature, but which is also a guiding framework to us um, here um, in our group, which we use in different projects if we want to um, analyze and evaluate human robot interaction. Um, and um, so these are different dimensions, which um, then can influence different variables like trust, for example, acceptance, workload, well-being. We've Arash has already uh, mentioned some of them, um, and they can all uh, together then um, have an influence on how the human perceives the interaction and and can make up like a um, yeah well describe the whole interaction quality. And uh, one of the areas, for example, is function allocation, um, where we have to consider which task we're giving to the human um, and which is left to the robot. This task, um, it's, uh, the um, allocation of task itself can become even more flexible in advanced robotics. And so then the process itself can become um, a source of, for example, trust, or it can become a source of motivation or satisfaction. Um, and if we um, consider operation and supervision of these systems, we have to consider the implementation process. So, for example, um, do we take into account um, the worker participation and aspect like that? Because this will eventually also um, have influence on how I perceive the interaction. Um, the same is true for task design. Task design um, is also not only um, in human robot interaction, but in any socio technical system perspective, a core dimension, because it's always the combining element between a human and a technical system. And so here um, there are different risks, but also opportunities that can derive from the task designs, so or for example, uh, related to job control. Um, there's always the possibility um, that uh, I could, um, I can I decrease, decrease the job control, which will not be very beneficial for motivation or well being, but I have also the opportunity to increase it. And last but not least, um, we've already also mentioned that and I think this is this dimension is very, um, very specific for um, human robot interaction because the other dimensions, they also, um, they can also be valid for other automating technologies. Um, but with an interaction design, we have the question of anthropomorphic design. So I always have to be aware of any anthropomorphic cue I use will have an effect on the human. Um, and this effect can either be beneficial or not. For example, um, if, I, yeah, if, I, if I use cues, I always will um, have expectations as a user that, for example, um, eyes uh, that I will expect uh, the robot to have sensors that will is able to um, is able to uh, have or re receive visual cues. Um, and then, of course, we have very general design principles, um, which, um, especially in human robot interaction, could also um, change in the hierarchy. That's also something we are going to look at in future research. Um, so these are just some basic dimensions which have to be considered. Of course, you always have to take into account the um, specific context you're dealing with and the specific tasks. So for example, if you have a system in a um, caring or educational um, setting, um, again, the example of anthropomorphic uh, design, um, you have a third party, for example, interacting them because you have a patient or a client. So um, things you um, use to improve this interaction, for example, with the client could have other effects on the worker. So this is just something you have to have in mind. 
the same um, how it's true for a manufacturing context here maybe um, the anthropomorphic design is not so important but rather the aspect for example of job control because I have um, per se very repetitive tasks in manufacturing and here the risk could arise um, that job control could decrease even more so I just have to consider that when implementing these systems. Um, and just to give you some information on um, what, how we use these different variables in our um, experiments or in our studies and projects we um, do. So here, you've already seen this a couple of times now, it's the SOFIA project um, where we um, assess um, user expectations regarding, um, for example, mobile robots um, prior, so before they interact uh, with the system. And so we do that in field pilot applications. Um, and we have done that in a couple of other research uh, projects as well. And this um, gives us the opportunity not only to assess um, what people want, but also to create like a benchmark um, of uh, what, um, what users or potential users from different backgrounds, but for the same system expect. Um, and also then we later on ma match that with the um, actual experience um, dialogue principles in this case. Um, and of course, this gives, gives us information uh, on whether the expectations the users had before match the actual experience. And if there is a mis mismatch, and uh, we know from literature that this could be a crucial factor in reducing trust. So this is, again, something um, yeah, just good to know and to describe the interaction quality. Um, and what we also do, um, we um, in our lab, we create um, or try to create very, very realistic um, um, working tasks. So, for example, um, um, assembly tasks, where we then um, variate different task characteristics, but also the dialogue principles, and then again analyze um, how the human or the user perceives um, the situation. As we also address workload. Um, the emotional states um, and things like that, but this is mostly done um, using questionnaire um, and yes, this is the method we use here. Um, and then this is just um, another project I would like to mention um, we are doing for the um, uh, European Agency for Safety uh, and Health. Um, and here um, we are trying um, or to give an overview of policies, research and practices um, in relation to advanced robotics, also AI-based systems um, for the automation of tasks and occupational safety and health. And here um, we are really, so apart from going into the lab and uh, pilot studies, we are really looking for real use cases. So systems that are fully integrated, um, fully working and running. Currently, um, we are looking for these use cases and best practices. And I just well, I wanted to use uh, this as an opportunity um, to give, yeah, to just uh, to present another shout out. We've done this in social media. We've, um, you see this here, there's, uh, Sasha has already posted a link, but I just wanted to, because I know that there are a lot of um, people here. And, um, you know, if you know someone or if you have a company on your hand or in your mind, say, okay, I know they've got a good practice. They've got advanced robotics on their shop floor, in their hospital, any uh, thing you can think of, then please feel free to contact us. Also, please feel free to distribute this further. Um, this would be, uh, would help us a lot. And we're really interested in this, um, um, yeah, in these good practices. So let me just sum that up. Um, currently, um, yes, as we've seen the prevalence of advanced robotics, which can closely interact with workers in Europe is still relatively low. Um, however, I think that um, especially the integration of AI has the potential to boost uh, these systems and in their interaction capabilities. And I think um, in the near future, um, the number will um, increase. Um, and when they do, I think it's very important to consider um, different dimensions um, being especially interaction design and task design, function allocation, operation and supervision, 
because they can really contribute um, to uh, enable um, a um, human-centered interaction quality. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any um, questions or I'm looking forward to the discussion, um, please contact us if you have any other um, yeah, information, especially um, on the good practices. Um, and of course, as it's the time of the year, I wish you a happy Christmas. <laughs> thank you. Oh, yes, and maybe one last slide. <laughs> um, I don't know, Sasha, if you were going to say this or, but um, yes, okay. something just, uh, on the um, on the TC. Um, this is also, if you want to join the TC, if you want to participate, uh, we've got a LinkedIn group. And um, you can just um, send Sasha or myself um, a message and we, we can, um, well, you can, you can participate in the LinkedIn group. Um, so far, um, we are supporting, for example, um, the IEA um, Congress, um, and we are um, so also supporting the IEEE um, Conference uh, on Advanced Robotics, the ASO. It's going to come up uh, next May in uh, California. Um, so we've linked these activities. So we've linked the IEA and the IEEE. Um, the call for paper is going to come pretty soon, I think. Um, and if you're interested, um, then yes, please participate. And maybe it will be something where we can see each other in person, which would be very nice. Yes, thank you, um, Patricia, for the for, for a very nice presentation. Um, yeah, of course, I also do have a question for you. I think in the chat we have a question for um, on on uh, published papers. I think we we can share that information um, if you just uh, contact Patricia. And uh, yeah, you, you said the the International Robotics Federation says in ten years we have uh, fifty percent of the workers on the shop floor do have a robotic companion. Um, and now you've seen also the technology that Arash is developing, that Julie is developing. Um, will you say, um, not if this is happening, because that's what the Robotic Association says, but is this um, something we should be looking forward um, with the technology we've learned today about, with the possibilities of robotics adapting to humans? Or is it some kind of, is it scary? We have to, we have to prepare for something specific. So any, any thoughts on that? Yes. Uh... <laughs> I actually thought about that <laughs> when I was uh, preparing the presentation. Um, well, I think if we um, if we always have the human factors perspective, or if we always consider um, the human to be in the center, then I think we don't have to be afraid of that. Because I mean, especially the things Julie and Arash have shown, I think they are pretty good examples as how the technology should adapt to the human. Um, and this is not only in a physical way, but also in a cognitive way. Um, and if this works smoothly, um, and uh, yes, if, if not only, um, well, I mean, of course, money rules the world. <laughs> That's uh, if, it, if it doesn't pay off, if there is no, if there is, if there is no business case, of course, um, we won't see that and it's not going to be there only because it feels nice or it feels good. But I think we can meet both goals. Um, so I don't think we have to be afraid. No, not yet. That, that's a very a good good outlook on the uh, technologies to, to be developed. Um, and I think it's it's a very good, good, good last words for these for these panel. Um, so so with that being said, um, I would like to thank um, the speakers very much. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very much, Arash. Thank you very much, Patricia, for your time, um, for sharing your research insights. I would like to, to thank Lynn Strother from the IEA. She supported the whole webinar in the background. And um, I would like to thank the audience um, for your participation, for your interest, for your comments, for your questions. And um, I know it's very important uh, to be on time, but we still do have five minutes. Um, and I don't close earlier because with my last words, I would like to hand over um, now to uh, Thomas Alexander. Um, he's here with us. He's the vice president and current treasurer of the International Economics um, Association for some final re re words, uh, for some final words. And um, 
With that being said, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much to everyone. And uh, please go ahead, Thomas. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha, for this uh, introduction. Thank you again to the great speakers, to the experts here. And it was a wonderful, a great uh, webinar. And I really enjoyed uh, uh, participating and being a part of that. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for the audience for, for your interest in this topic. I think that is really very important when we're talking about robotics, human-robot interaction, not to forget the H in there, that is the human, which is really very important. And I, I really learned a lot today about this topic here and to see um, how, how, how the state of the art, how the state of the uh, research looks like at the, at the moment. For all of you, a little bit of advertisement, <laughs> of course, on, on behalf of IEA, um, that is that we have this new format here, the webinar, which we haven't had uh, before we had this uh, pandemic situation. And uh, we discovered that this is a great opportunity here to get people from different regions, from different global uh, regions, uh, from countries, nations, et cetera, with a different background together to learn things, to uh, discuss uh, topics and to come together. And we would like to take that opportunity in the future with other topics as well. We have 27 uh, technical committees we have webinars, or we had webinars already about uh, working at home, about effective design, about um, healthcare, actually human factors in healthcare. And we want to go on with that in future. So it would be great. Maybe it's not always robots involved, but it will be humans involved in there. And it would be great if you could join that as well then. So again, thank you very much for that. And it was really an excellent webinar. Thank you very much for that on behalf of IEA and the executive committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers and for hosting us. Thank you very much. And I would say with that, I think that's the goodbye then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.